classes in polymer dynamics based on George Philly's book, Phenomenology of Polymer Solution Dynamics, Cambridge University Press, 2011. And today, this lecture is Lecture 6, Small Molecule Motion. In any event, I'm Professor Phillies. This is Physics 597D, Phenomenology of Polymer Dynamics. And today we're going to discuss the rest of Chapter 4 of my book on light scattering. And we're going to discuss Chapter 5. And because the class composition is more materials than physics, I'm not going to discuss very much of the theory issues of how light scattering works or how you can calculate colloid dynamics. The calculation is important and will show up in chapter 10 because we will demonstrate we can actually calculate for spherical particles how the diffusion coefficient depends on concentration. And we get eh, more or less the right answer. And the fact that we get more or less the right answer gives us good reason to believe that we are actually seeing a phenomenon that we understand. So let us go back to where we were last time. And as usual, the chalk has gone for a walk. And the erasers have gone for a walk. And therefore, I must briefly go for a walk. So let us sketch how scattering works. And what I'm going to sketch works equally well for X-ray static, X-ray scattering, for electron scattering, for neutron scattering, and for light scattering. We have a wave coming in. The cross lines I'm drawing are the planes of constant phase. The light is going that way. I'll say light because that's what I usually use. And here are particles that scatter the light. And the light gets, strikes them and it actually heads off in all directions. However, some of it heads off and reaches the detector. In a real experiment, if it's light scattering, this distance is very small. The whole scattering cell is, the laser beam is focused down to say 100 microns across, and the image we collect this way is the same size, and this distance to the photo multiplier tube might be a meter or two. So in fact, the light rays going to the detector have to be traveling very nearly parallel to each other to get to the detector. If you are worried about whether they actually get to the detector at the same time, or same direction, you look up a paper by my PhD advisor, George Benedek, and this is a late 60s, early 70s paper, and he worries about the question, and the answer is we're good as long as the optics are set up properly. However, this path length and this path length are not the same. And therefore, if we consider these two light waves getting to the detector at the same time, they had to start here at different times. This ray had to start off at the laser earlier than this one did. And since they started at two different times, they had two different phases. Now I'm going to assume you had some freshman physics at some time, and you've seen an interference experiment with lasers. Yes? Yeah. Yes? Okay. Um, so what happens is, the two light rays get to the detector, and if they're in phase with each other, the light is bright. And if they're 180 degrees out of phase, the light waves cancel if there's no light at all. Now, in fact, there's somewhat more than two scattering particles. There are loads and loads of them in solution, and you have to add up what all of them do. Now, the first approximation is, the light shows up with all different phases equally and goes to zero. But that's only an approximation, and it, there are fluctuations. And so at some time, I have drawn things so that these two particles happen to give light that is scattered in phase. And other light waves 
I'm drawing lines like this for a reason. Other particles that lie along these lines scatter light that also gets to the detector in phase. Particles that are here scatter light that is 180 degrees out of phase. So the light scattered from these particles adds coherently. The light scattered from these particles adds anti-coherently. But you notice there are more particles here and here than there are there. And therefore, in net, there is some scattered light. Have you ever seen this phenomenon? Yes, this is why the sky glows in the daytime. Namely, there's light scattering from the air because the air is on an atomic scale is not perfectly uniform. In fact, what we are looking at is a density fluctuation that has some a concentration fluctuation that has some amplitude that I'll call A and that varies in space as a cosine wave x is the distance this way there is a great deal of math that get, just got suppressed the important issue though is you are looking at micro, hang on a sec microscopic fluctuations that occur because the particles move around at random and by random chance produce density fluctuations that look like a cosine wave. Question? Yeah, is that axis is perpendicular with the atom lines? It is perpendicular to the atom lines, but the useful feature is this K is a, K is a vector pointing that way. We could do this as K, vector pointing that way, dot R, position of the atom in the system. And how do we define K? Well, the light wavelength is lambda. 2 pi over lambda is the wave vector of the light. And the wave vector going out is pointing in a direction. That's a unit vector pointing that way. Minus 2 pi over lambda. The light is the same color after scattering as before. But it was initially going in the direction i. It is at the end going in the direction f. And the change in the wave vector of the light, it's just a change in direction, is this change in k is called the scattering vector. And since I'm, I do not have a great infinite amount of time to tell you about this, I am going to refer you to several superb books on the topic. And there is a book by Byrne and Kikora. There are, I believe it's now, two books by Ben Chu, who was, or I think he's just retired, at Stony Brook. Very nice fellow. Very good books. Um, I, there are two collections by uh, Wynn Brown. There are two NATO Advanced Science Institute collections. Those go back to about 1970. And if you refer to these, you can get a much more detailed description. What is the important issue here? Well, first of all, I said you get scattering because the particles give you a density fluctuation that looks like a cosine wave. You should realize that Every possible cosine wave is being driven by the fluctuations at the same time. And each different cosine wave gives you a scattering in a different direction. So we just sample one of them. And so if we plotted concentration versus x, and ignore the fact that there are all these other things going on at the same time, you would see a fluctuation of the concentration around its equilibrium value that looks like that. 
this distance is microscopic. It's sort of um, one over the square root of the number of molecules in the system. It's very tiny, but that's all you need. And what does this thing do if you watch it and measure its amplitude as a function of time? On the average, if you wait for a moment that it's, that it's large, the, constant, the fluctuation decays as e to the minus exponential decay. This k, which is sort of this distance, is 2 pi over k equals the, wave, the scattering wavelength, k square diffusion coefficient t. And in the simple case, these things simply relax exponentially because the particles are just doing diffusion. And therefore, if you look at the scattered light and the time evolution of these fluctuations in the scattering, you can measure a diffusion coefficient. That's actually very useful. Now, there's something else you can do that's a little more subtle. Many molecules, or polymer, monomer segments, are not spheres. As a result, if you send in a light with one polarization, when it strikes the molecule, what happens? Well, it's an electric field. It's striking molecular matter. It creates an electrical dipole in the matter. And the dipole is not parallel to the original electric field because this isn't a sphere. And when the light comes out to the side, this is coming out straight towards you. The light was originally polarized like this, vertical in the plane of the blackboard. But when the light comes out towards you, some of the light will be depolarized. It will come out not with the original vertical polarization, but with horizontal polarization. Okay? However, this molecule, it moves. It rotates. As a result, as time goes on, and the required time is nanoseconds or picoseconds, something very short, microseconds, very short time, this thing rotates, and the amount of light going out towards you that has been depolarized changes. If we can characterize the time scale on which the depolarization occurs, we can measure how long it takes for a molecule to rotate, or how long it takes for a segment of a long polymer chain to rotate. And you can actually do this experimentally. That's depolarized light scattering. Okay? So that's depolarized scattering. Now you can get, there are other ways of getting depolarized scattering. If you simply scatter light from a rough surface, some of it comes off. But we're talking about molecular scattering. Depolarization is often quite weak. And you have to work very hard to isolate the depolarized light, but you can. Questions? Uh, is that at least assumption that with the MIDI, the polarized? Oh, yes. The light actually has to be polarized to make the experiment work. Now, in fact, if you are doing 90 degree scattering, there are some math details and things cancel. But in general, you have to start with a polarized light source. Any good laser will do this. Mm -hmm. And you have to separate out the depolarized scattering, which is very weak, from the polarized scattering, which is very strong. And there are optical devices that will do this for you. OK, that's depolarized scattering. It gives you molecular reorientation. Okay, what else do we discuss in chapter four? There is one last bit. We are talking about diffusion coefficients. Now, for, say, an isolated sphere in water, 
There is a result due to Stokes. Well, he didn't know about what was going to be done with his work. And Einstein, who did the important part, what Sto Einstein said was the diffusion coefficient had to be the thermal energy kT over a drag coefficient f that resists the motion. What is f? Well, if I pull the sphere through water at some speed, there is a drag force on the sphere, which it points backwards to the direction of the velocity. That's where the minus sign comes from. And the proportionality constant is f, the drag coefficient. For spheres in water, Stokes' law, this is where Stokes comes in, f is 6 pi eta. Eta is the solvent viscosity. A is the radius of the sphere. There's A. OK, there's the Stokes-Einstein equation. Now suppose, however, you have a solution that is not dilute. What happens? Well, it, what actually happens is fairly complicated. It's the section of chapter 4 we're not reading. Um, however, there are people who will say you can write the diffusion coefficient as kT divided by 6 pi eta. And they put in, that is a Greek letter psi, what is called a dynamic scaling length. This equation comes from critical phenomena theory. If you take a liquid and you heat it up and you compress it, there is a temperature and a density I guess the liquid would be over here, high density. There is a temperature at a density at which the liquid phase and the gas phase become indistinguishable, the critical point. Okay? And if you go near the critical point and measure diffusion or diffusion of heat, or in a binary liquid, diffusion of the two components through each other, you discover that diffusion becomes very slow. And you dis if you look at the composition or the density here, you discover there are non-uniform regions of size psi. I'm being very indistinct here. And psi gets bigger and bigger as you get very close to the critical point. And the, re the assertion is the reason that the diffusion slows down is that psi gets very large. And you're looking at a diffusion of a collective object whose size becomes very big near the critical point, so it doesn't move fast. Now, we are not going to talk about critical points more in the course. You should be aware of critical phenomena, because there are bunches of materials processing methods where critical fluids turn out to be useful. In fact, one of my carpet cleaners uses critical carbon dioxide instead of our organic solvents to clean rugs. Uh, however, having said that, um, people have taken this result and tried to carry it over and use it, try to use it to describe mutual diffusion Diffusion that relaxes concentration fluctuations in polymer solutions. As we will see when we get to the right chapter, this approach is completely wrong. But you should be aware that there are people who do this. Question. Uh, the dynamic scaling length is the same to the which involves the accurate hydrodynamic radius. Because in what involves it is IH for this and the, and the Psi plays the same role. It's a length. And it plays the same role as the hydrodynamic radius. And so what happens 
the proposal is that if you have lots of particles, instead of their individual radius or polymer coils, instead of their individual radius governing how they move, what governs how they move is this length that gives the distance over which polymer motions are correlated. And so psi replaces R sub H. Okay? Okay, let us shove ahead to chapter 5. And we are now actually going to start discussing motions. And we are going to start by discussing what are mostly single particle motions. And we are going to start by discussing the smallest things we can find, which are solvent molecules. We will eventually push on from solvent molecules to chapter 6, and we will discuss little bits of polymer chains. We have to start someplace. So, having said, we're going to discuss how solvent molecules move through a polymer solution, um, and, or other small molecules move. Uh, the first question is what you might ask. Well, suppose I take a liquid, I can measure with various techniques how fast small molecules diffuse through it. And suppose I add to the liquid polymer coils. What's going to happen to the liquid and how is this going to affect the ability of the small molecules to diffuse? And the most simple-minded answer is that if you increase the concentration of the polymer molecules, you might expect the viscosity of the solution will go up, the resistance to motion will go up, and therefore diffusion will slow down. That's at least vaguely a reasonable sounding thing. So let's start with the simplest question. Suppose I am looking at a solvent molecule or a sodium ion or something diffusing through a simple liquid. That is, we're going to start, I'm going to start with something even simpler than this. I'm going to start with a simple liquid. And I am going to change the viscosity. How do I change the viscosity of a simple liquid? Ideas? Increase the concentration of the concentration of polymer. Well, we want to starting with no polymer in the solution. Well, number one, we can change the temperature. Temperature. Decrease the temperature, right? Increase or decrease. Have you actually seen this effect? Suppose you have a glass full of ice water and a glass full of water that you have just brought to a boiling point. You shake each of them. The hot water seems to slosh back and forth more. That's because there's a factor of three change in the viscosity between ice cold water and boiling water. And you notice factor of three change in the viscosity is just barely perceptible to human senses. It's not something we're set up to see. The other thing you can do, though, which is the actual procedure we're going to look at, is you can add solutes. That is, you take, for example, water, and you stir in sugar. Or you stir in, uh, or you take a hydrocarbon solvent, you add some other molecule to it. And you can change the viscosity of a liquid a great deal by looking at solutions rather than simple liquids. And we can go back to the results of Heber Green, who was an Australian who worked at the turn of the last century. The paper references are to about 1908. And what he did was to measure electrophoretic mobility of small ions. And other people have since measured diffusion under similar conditions. And the question is, how does the solution viscosity, as we change the composition, affect the diffusion coefficient of small molecules? Yes? Uh, the solvent, can solvent be the polymer? 
it would be entirely possible to take a polymer, melt it, and measure the diffusion of small molecules through a polymer melt. Okay, so can that be the shear thinning for the viscosity? Shear um, no, we're actually, well, it might be shear thinning or shear thickening as a substance, but we're just going to be talking about small molecule liquids. We're going to start with the small molecule end rather than the melt end. Okay? So we're going to look at small molecule liquids. And we measure the electrophoretic mobility, how fast the ions move through the solution. We measure the conductivity. Or we measure the diffusion coefficient. And we can plot this versus viscosity. And what we find is that in not very viscous um, solutions, 1 over the diffusion coefficient, is proportional to a to the first power. That is, if d is like 1 over 6 pi, it's really kt, over 6 pi a to a, then 1 over d is proportional to the viscosity, says Stokes-Einstein. And if we, our liquids aren't too viscous, that's exactly what we find. Now, there's a limit down here because there aren't a lot of really low viscosity liquids. They're not they're liquids that are less viscous than water, but you can't get down to zero. And we chug ahead. A pure water at room temperature is like 0.9 centipoise. That's the unit of viscosity. And we chug ahead, and we get out to about 5 centipoise. And at some point near 5 centipoise, there is a sudden change. And at higher viscosities, we find that d inverse is proportional to eta to about the two-thirds power. And so if you look at diffusion through a, real, a viscous liquid, it doesn't behave like this at all. There have been an, an extensive series of papers, people who have studied this in different systems using several different experimental variables. Um, the crossover location depends a bit on the molecular system. I mean, if I start in, heck in uh, an organic solvent and stir in things that will dissolve in it, there's no reason for 5 centipoise to be the magic number, but it's fairly small. But the crossover behavior is the same. There's a strong dependence on viscosity, and then at larger viscosities, there's a much weaker viscosity dependence. Now, one thing you might, okay, so that's not quite what you expected, but now you know what happens if you just change the viscosity and it's a small molecule liquid. Suppose, however, this is the plot for, for example, a sodium ion or a solvent molecule. Suppose you instead use polystyrene latex. Uh, and I shall say very briefly what a polystyrene latex is. Namely, there are procedures for synthesizing polystyrene. And they are run in water and a surfactant. Or they end up, I should say, in water and a surfactant. And you make little balls of polystyrene that are, have either been coated with a surfactant or are surface modified. That's a carboxylate group. And because the surface has been modified, the sphere is charged. And because the object is charged, because it's been surface modified or you stuck a surfactant in or something, these little polystyrene drops dissolve in water. Of course, the polystyrene isn't water soluble. It stays as a little drop. And the trick is, if you are very clever with the synthesis, you make these things, and they're all identical to within 1% anyhow in size. They're all very spherical. So they're a very nice object to use as a probe particle. 
course, the Ra uh, Rodko and Krombach, when you read their paper, they're talking about these. And we will measure diffusion coefficient using light scattering against T over eta. And there are two ways to change the viscosity. You can change the temperature at least over a moderate range. And you can change the viscosity. For example, instead of working in water, you can work in water plus glycerol. And so back in about 1979, I did this. And we show that D is very nicely linear in T over eta. That is, and that's true up to, we got up to 1,000 centifoids. Um, and that's exactly what you would expect from Stokes-Einstein. However, if you alert, uh, you're alert, you'll notice for these things which are quite large, D is just linear in T over eta out here. For these small objects above about 5 centipoise, 1 over D is linear in viscosity only at first, and then there's a crossover. So this peculiar crossover effect in small molecule behavior does not repeat itself for mesoscopic particles. OK. Now let us push out. And we will push ahead to figure 5.1. And because we have pushed ahead to figure 5.1, what I do there is to plot the diffusion coefficient versus the concentration of polymer. That is, we are now going to chug ahead, and we are going to look at how fast the solvent actually moves through a polymer solution. And we are on in the book page 116. And so we are looking at the motion of for example, uh, the solvent, or we're looking at the tracer diffusion of a small molecule in the solvent as we add polymer and increase the viscosity. And we ask, what happens? And the answer is that out to around 400 gram per liter, there is a decrease in the diffusion coefficient as I add polymer. And this decrease is approximately e to the minus some constant concentration to the first power. And the data lies on the line. And there are bunches of people who've done the experiment. You see the same thing. And then at higher concentrations, there is a rollover. And the measurements still lie on a smooth curve. But this is a smooth curve, e to the minus some other constant a, c to some power nu. And in this case, nu is greater than, oops, I don't mean 0, I mean 1. That is, there is one behavior out to about 400 gram per liter. And there is another behavior at higher concentrations. At the time I wrote the book, I could describe this, but there was no good explanation for it. And I wasn't sure what the explanation was, but I describe it. And when we get to the last chapter, there are a whole bunch of information that there are a number of molecular properties of polymer solutions that change vaguely at this concentration. Now, it's not, now, for each system, the crossover is a sharp line. But it's not the same concentration in every polymer solvent mixture. And if I said you look at a bunch of these and you find it someplace in the range, 350 to 500 gram per liter. That's approximately right. And if you look at subsequent figures in the book, you will see more examples of the same curve. So what happens if we increase the viscosity of a polymer sol of a solution by adding polymer? We see this rather odd concentration dependence. That concentration dependence does not come very close to being the concentration dependence of the viscosity of the liquid. We'll get to that in a piece as you add polymer. So you look at this and you wonder what's happening. 
And there is a very recent paper by Kai et al. It's in Macromolecules. Two thousand and eleven. It's late. It's late last year, and they discuss various conditions and concentrations, and they make an observation. They make a prediction observation, which can be translated as: once you look carefully at what's going on, we are looking at a polymer solution from the side. Okay, and if we were all the way to the melt. Here are some polymer chains that are in the melt A, B, C, and they're quite close together. These are cross sections, they're quite small. And here is a solvent molecule of some sort. I've just drawn a hexagon so you can tell it's not a solvent. And if that we're in a melt, the space between the polymer chains is small, and the solvent molecules can't get through the gaps. But if we dilute the polymer with solvent, at some concentration, there is, well, there's a distance which I will call psi. I'm not a very good artist. I should not try drawing Greek letters. Psi, which is a distance between polymer coils. And at some point, the typical size R of the polymer is such that it can slip between polymer chains consistently. And so the, the solvent can flow between the coils as though it's a liquid as opposed to isolated molecules that have to look for holes in some sense. And if you ask, well, how big is this concentration? Well, realistically speaking, the polymer coil cross sections are considerably larger than the size of an average solvent molecule. But if you estimate what sort of concentrations this transition from no space to space occurs, it's something like the 350 or 500 grams per liter that we're talking about. Now, it's not exactly that, but it's not obvious that the criterion should be this is the same size as that. Um, there are molecular arguments involved, and, you do, and the details, this is basically a back of the envelope estimate, but the answer is that that change in solvent behavior appears to take place when the gaps between polymer coils as seen from the side are now no longer large enough on the average for solvent molecules to fit through the gaps between the polymer chains. That's a very approximate statement, but it appears to be roughly correct in terms of giving the correct concentration for the crossover I have just described. So in any event, that is the motion of small molecules, the translational motion of small molecules through polymer coils. And you can, there are lots of measurements of the same thing, and in most systems, you see the same effect. Now, if you make the molecule only slightly larger, figure 5.7 shows fluorescein dye. It's a small molecule. Its size is something like a half a nanometer. And it's diffusing through hydroxypropyl cellulose, so here is the diffusion coefficient of the fluorescein. Here is the concentration of hydroxypropyl cellulose. This is a semi-log plot on which you see a straight line. And the diffusion coefficient goes as e to the minus alpha c to the nu. This is the uh, polymer concentration, except it's c to the first in this case. And you just see an exponential drop off of the diffusion coefficient. Now, there's one interesting feature of hydroxypropyl cellulose. Hang on a second. Hydroxypropyl cellulose has a liquid crystal phase transition about halfway across that graph. The hydroxypropyl cellulose is a rigid polymer, not quite as rigid as these things, though short pieces are. 
And there is a concentration at which if you concentrate them enough, the polymers want to line up, or at least the segments line up, parallel to each other so they pack more cleanly. The fluorescein diffusing through the HPC doesn't notice that this has occurred. It just diffuses. But there's just a straight line straight through the phase transition. Question? Yeah. Uh, the y-axis is the ds divided with ds0. It has that for relatively a diffusion coefficient. Correct. What has been done in figure 5.7, and I do this fairly often, is we take the diffusion coefficient, and I divide by the diffusion coefficient of the fluorescein in pure solvent, and therefore, up at the top, the diffusion coefficient is 1. Now, you could, you could, if you didn't do the division, you'd simply have different numbers on the side scale. But this is just division by a constant. And if you're on a semi-log plot, when you divide by a constant, you just change the labels on the side axis. You don't change anything else. So that is diffusion in a polymer. Except there is this one peculiar feature. It is possible to do measurements in all sorts of <coughs> solvents. And one of the solvents that you could measure diffusion in is Eric 1248, which is a polychlorinated biphenyl. Um, in terms of chemical safety issues, it is a material you treat with respect. But it's been used industrially on a large scale, though there have been issues when people haven't been careful. Not this particular one, but just polychlorinated biphenyls in general. Stand for BPA. No, this would be a PCB. Um, however, the interesting feature is, suppose we put something, a probe, a small molecule into it, and we measure the diffusion coefficient of the small molecule as a function of concentration. And we are in this particular, poly, uh, this particular material, which has been used very systematically, experimentally, in studies of this sort. It's a very viscous liquid. And there are a number of polymers you can add where you get exactly the effect I've talked about. Namely, the diffusion coefficient of a small molecule falls off exponentially with increasing concentration. However, you can also find a polymer where you add the polymer and absolutely nothing happens. And most peculiarly, if you add polybutadiene you add the polymer and the diffusion coefficient of the, of the probe goes up instead of down. And what we can say on this is that the polymer appears to be modifying the behavior of the solvent. Well, that's not unreasonable. After all, we say we have a solution. The um, solvent modifies the behavior of the polymer. The polymer in dilute solution doesn't behave the way it did in the melt. And therefore, why should we be su surprised that the polymer is changing the solvent at the same time. And in a certain sense, you shouldn't. But a lot of people didn't think of this at first. And there was nice work by, let's see, Lodge, Amilar, and various other people who sorted out the fact that you add polymer to a solution, and it perturbs how the solvent behaves. There is a somewhat more dramatic demonstration of this when we get to section 5.4. And in section 5.4, we look at solvent rotation. How do you look at rotation? Well, you take a solvent molecule that is not a sphere and that depolarizes scattered light. And then you can do measurements to s determine the time scale on which the polymer mo solvent molecule, excuse me, here's a solvent molecule, 
you can determine the time scale on which it changes, the direction it faces. And if you do this in a simple liquid, you get some very small numbers, pico, not picoseconds, but nanoseconds anyhow. But if you add solvent, you discover that there are two populations of solvent molecules, one which relaxes very quickly, and one of which, at least in part, rotates very slowly. Now, you have to be a little careful when I say fast and slow. You don't actually know that it's some molecules that rotate fast and some molecules that rotate slowly. It might be that you have a molecule, and for example, it can rotate rapidly around this axis, at least at the moment, but it's inhibited from rotating around this axis. As you increase the polymer concentration, the fast moving molecules tend to disappear, and the slow moving molecules dominate. And the inference is the polymer, at least the typical polymer, is inhibiting the rotation of molecules. And, well, how could it do that? And one answer is, here, the blackboard represents, the thing the erasers are, are resting on represents the polymer chain. And here is a solvent molecule near the polymer chain, or here's the blackboard. The blackboard surface represents a polymer chain. Well, this molecule is free to rotate like this, but it can't rotate into the plane of the board any faster than the blackboard moves. Of course, the polymer, it does move, but it moves quite slowly relative to solvent speed. And therefore, the polymer is doing something somehow to affect polymer, how fast the um, local solvent moves. The question, uh, okay, so, what is the effective range of a polymer coil? Is it simply affecting the whole solution uniformly? Is it only affecting molecules close to the polymer chain? Since the mechanism isn't specified yet, I just hypothesized a mechanism so you could see what might be happening. Um, the question you might ask is, well, what is going on? And the experimental data I just talked to you about on Aerochlor leads to a solution. How do you do the experiment? Well, it's a very clever experiment. Neutron and Lodge. And what Crown and Lodge said was, we are fortunate to have a, a couple of polymers that influence solvent motion in opposite ways. One speeds solvent motion up, the other slows solvent motion down. So we can make block copolymers. And one choice is half of the molecule is A, half of the molecule is B. And another choice is we'll just look at a mixture A and B. That's as non-uniform as you can get. And the third choice is we will have random copolymerization and we will have A and B right next to each other. Now if the range is extremely long, all of these will do about the same thing because each solvent molecule will be close to A enough to A, some A's and some B's. If the range is very short, these will tend to cancel each other, and these will not cancel each other. There will be some a fast component and a slow component. Ditto here, the ones near an A will be fast, and the ones near a B will be slow. And by looking at these, we can infer the range over which the polymer affects molecular motion. And the answer, they do a detailed analysis, is one to two solvent diameters. So the solvent molecules very near a chain have their rotational motion perturbed. 
And the solvent molecules that are way out from a polymer chain, yeah, way out, three or four molecular diameters, uh, 20 angstroms, but that's way out enough, are not perturbed. And that was the analysis of Lodge and Cron on rotational diffusion. It's a very clever experiment, and you can read about it yourselves. I see, however, we are out of time. We will continue this discussion next Monday when the first writing project is due. And you each have a description of what you should have done. A reasonable thing to do is to have some tables at the end or someplace which mention what each of your searches found. And then three to five pages written on papers you found that in some sense use electrophoresis to give measurements that like the Baron and Rodbard and Krombach papers could be used to study what polymers do in solution. We're done. <laughs>